The final item of business is members' business debate on motion 15292 in the name of Gordon MacDonald on Marie Curie's Great Daffodil Appeal. Uh, the debate will be conducted this evening by Emma Harper on Gordon's behalf. And the debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? And can I welcome everyone to the public gallery? And uh, I know what all you Marie Curie volunteers are like, so can I say to you right at the start, we'll have no clapping, heckling, or anything else going on. <laughs> There'll be time at the end of deb the debate to show any appreciation that you may wish. And I call on Emma Harper to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to bring this important debate to the Chamber this evening to raise awareness of Marie Curie's great daffodil appeal. And I'm speaking on behalf of a motion brought to Parliament by my friend and colleague Gordon MacDonald, who is unfortunately unable to be here this evening. And I understand that more than 100 Marie Curie volunteers and staff from all across Scotland are here tonight, including the charity's chief uh, new Chief Executive Matthew Reid and I'm sure colleagues across Chamber will join me in welcoming them here to their Parliament. <laughs> I'd like to start by paying tribute to yourself, presiding Officer, for the support you've given Marie Curie over the past few years, leading members' debates, raising awareness and hosting parliamentary events. And I will be doing this this evening also. And by the way, presiding officer told me that she was out on Saturday in her yellow top hat, collecting for the appeal also, and I wish I was there to witness her sonsy face. <laughs> presiding officer, the great daffodil appeal is one of the most iconic and recognised fundraising drives of the year. People all over the country will wear their yellow daffodil badges with a sense of pride that they will be donating money to support Marie Curie to deliver their world-class palliative care services in our communities to support their research, to support their campaigning, and to support the information services that they also provide. Last year, my colleague Joan McAlpine and I hosted a blooming great daffodil tea party in our regional office to raise funds and awareness. And earlier this year, I joined the palliative care cross-party group convened by my colleague Bob Doris, MSP, so that I could learn more about what could be done. Presiding officer, of course, I will. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank Emma Harper for taking the intervention. Just a, a name checking just presides me the opportunity to, to come to my feet to put on record the wonderful service that Marie Curie Hospice in Springburn in my constituency does for right across Glasgow. But Emma Harper uh, agree with me that it's also the, the, the Marie Curie community nurses who are invaluable in the city of Glasgow, including in the year 1718, where they supported 569 people at home, and that was 5,459 visits, that invaluable work and dedication that they provide to people who are in real difficult periods in their life. Emma Harper. I thank the member for, uh, for his intervention, and I think it's great that he is here in chamber supporting his Springburn constituents, who are the Marie Curie nurses, as well as the, the Springburn Marie Curie uh, um, Hospital, so thank you very much for being here. The services provided by Marie Curie are only possible through the dedication of the many thousands of volunteers donning top hats, bibs and collection buckets and braving the ever unpredictable good Scottish weather every March. And as always, the Scottish people are incredibly generous, donating thousands of pounds every year. And whether the daffodil is worn in solidarity or in memory of a loved one, each daffodil tells a story. My story is contained in my 30 years as a nurse. And last year, the Daffodil Appeal helped Marie Curie care for over 8,600 people living with a terminal illness, as well as their family members, friends and carers. They have a huge and irreplaceable impact on our communities at a time that can be incredibly difficult and challenging for families. Presiding officer, we can remind ourselves that the organisation takes the name from the twice Nobel Prize winning scientist Marie Curie for her research in radioactivity. And Marie agreed for her name to be used for a hospital staffed by women to care for and treat women with cancer. And the hospital was destroyed by a bomb in 1944, which led to the hospital being re-established as the Marie Curie charity. 
Marie Curie provides care for people with any terminal condition, whether that is terminal cancer, organ failure, heart disease or frailty. And increasingly, we see people presenting with many different and multiple conditions. They do, they do this across the whole of Scotland and the rest of the UK. Delivering frontline care services in 31 local authorities in Scotland through nursing and hospice services. Their volunteer befriending service, Helper, is now reaching out to new areas and caring for more and more people with an information and support service which now supports over 10,000 people a year UK wide. Marie Curie are also the biggest funder of palliative care research and with two research leads in Scotland and over 16 active research projects, much of that expertise and knowledge is generated right here. Presiding officer, I'm proud that the Scottish Government has an ambitious vision that everyone who needs palliative care will have access to it by 2021. This is determination that I wholeheartedly share. The Scottish Government's strategic framework for this action on palliative and end-of-life care sets this out and it is outstanding to see that progress is already being made. And this progress is supported by Marie Curie and others in the sector and I look forward to hearing from the Minister on the most recent up-to-date progress the Scottish Government and its partners are making. Presiding officer, it must also be acknowledged that sadly, despite progress, some people are still missing out. In Scotland, around 43,000 people who die each year need palliative care. Estimates suggest that a quarter of those people still miss out on some or all of the support they need. And we know that those dying with conditions other than terminal cancer such as dementia, heart failure and frailty, are less likely to access palliative care. Older people, black, Asian and minority ethnic populations, as well as people who define as LGBTI and those who come, come from our poorest communities are far less likely to get the care they need when terminally ill and dying. I think that we can all agree that this is not acceptable and I'm pleased that this is being recognised and address, addressed by a Scottish Government working for the people of Scotland. We know that Scotland's ageing population is something to celebrate, but it does mean that in the years to come, more people will be living longer and there will be an increased need for palliative care. Marie Curie themselves, they estimate that at least another 7,000 people every year will die needing palliative care support by 2040. That's 50,000 people that we need to make sure receive the support they deserve. So it's clear that we're going to have to do more to ensure that people get the care they need now and in the years to come. Presiding officer, when preparing for this debate, I was pleased to see the wealth of support Marie Curie provides to my South Scotland constituents. And I think it is worth highlighting some of this important work. Across the NHS in Fries and Galloway, over 2017 and 18, there were 4,359 visits made to 542 people and the patients by the region's there, there are 31 dedicated Marie Curie nurses. The support from these nurses allowed 72.5% of palliative care patients to die in a place that they chose, which I welcome. Additionally, I'm pleased that across South Scotland, Marie Curie have seven shops raising funds for the charity, located in Ayr, Presswick, Troon, Lanark, Newton Stewart, Stranraer and Dumfries. And with over 896 dedicated volunteers, I thank each and every one of them for their efforts to make the lives of others more comfortable. In closing, presiding officer, I would like to wish Marie Curie every success for this year's great daffodil appeal. And I would like to thank everyone at the charity for everything they do to support families across Scotland. I know the compassion, dignity, care, love and kindness they bring to everyone they look after and their families can never be covered in a simple thank you. But I want to be clear that gratitude of myself and of this parliament is here. Marie Curie provides support to our loved ones towards the end of their lives and it is our role as politicians to support them as best we can. Thank you. We move to the open debate. The speeches of around four minutes, please. Brian Whittle, followed by Gail Ross. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Can I uh, thank Gordon McDonald in his absence for bringing this debate to the Chamber? It firstly allow us the opportunity to thank uh, Marie Curie and, the, and other organisations offering palliative care for all and all their amazing work they do and to raise awareness of the Daffodil Appeal. Now, when I was actually sitting in my office last night wondering you know, what, 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 where I would go with my speech, uh, I happened to glance to, to my right and I have some uh, photographs uh, on my wall there uh, that, that uh, make me smile 
uh, and, and something, God, do we need to smile in this place sometimes? And, and there is a picture there uh, from in the mid 90s of a, a bunch of reprobates um, in a warm weather training camp. And it was, uh, Tommy McKean was there, and Elliot Bunny was there, and Mel Neath. And at the end of it, there's, uh, there's a, a friend of mine, uh, Don Flockhart, who sadly lost uh, her six year battle with cancer last month at the age of 51. And she was cared for in her last few months in the Marie Curie Hospice in Edinburgh. And if you'll indulge me a minute, uh, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I just want to go in to tell you she, what a prestigious uh, international athlete she actually was and still holds the Scottish record for the under 15 uh, 200 metres and she represented at Scottish and British level. I, I remember her humour and her cheek uh, in one weather training camps. She was always at something, always playing practical jokes, laughing and generally being really great company. Uh, I, I will say she gave me a really hard time about my politics. Uh, you lot over there would have loved her. Um, <coughs> and she managed to cram more into her 51 years uh, than most would do in several lifetimes. And there's so much I could tell you about her, uh, from teaching English to foreign students in Italy to learning yoga in India. She even assisted Paul McKenna, I found out. She assisted Paul McKenna in teaching him NLP. And that just scratches the surface uh, of what she achieved. It, it, she, she had a way of connecting with people uh, and a desire to help people. Uh, she once insisted that she worked with my middle daughter uh, with a positive mental attitude towards her, uh, her track racing and performance. She's been described as a force of nature and she was all of that and more. My thoughts are with her family and they're very grateful to Marie Curie uh, for the care and comfort they gave to Don and her family in the last few months. Now, I'm sure we all have a story to tell. The one thing that strikes me here is how young uh, Don was, and I'm sure when we consider palliative care, we automatically think of those later in life. As I've said before in this place, a positive and active lifestyle can definitely stack the cards in your favour, but it can't make you immune. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has a vision where everyone in need of palliative care will have access to it by 2021. However, there are currently one in four missing out on that much needed care. Whether that be in a hospice or a hospital, support to stay at home or in a care home, the ask is that the appropriate care is available in line with the health and social care plan. An acute hospital setting is rarely the right environment, but environment for end of life care, both from a patient's perspective and even from an economical perspective. We are all aware that people are living longer more co with more complex conditions, not just cancer and dementia. Therefore, we need to map out palliative care requirements of the future in the midst of the budgetary constraints, and that's, that's a key ask. One phrase struck me when reading the Marie Curie briefing document, it reminded me of the carers debate we had just last week. And I quote, <coughs> Far too many carers of those at the end of life are not getting the support they need to enable them to carry out their carer's role. More carers need to be identified. Now, I'm pretty sure that's the very same thing we said in this place last week. So while we get involved in arguments about Brexit and budgets and constitutional bun fights, this debate is an opportunity to remind us, through the clutter of politics, there are things everyday things affecting people's life that we can change. Can we all commit to making sure this is one of them? Deputy Presenting Officer. Gail Ross, followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I would also like to um, record my thanks to Gordon MacDonald for bringing this debate to the Parliament and also to Emma Harper for leading the debate. And I'd just like to say to Brian Whittle what a lovely tribute that was. Um, and I'd also like to say hello to everyone in the public gallery as well. Um, Marie Curie gave us a very detailed briefing um, to members with uh, activities in our own constituencies. I'd like to thank them for that. But most of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those working with Marie Curie who provide invaluable care and support to individuals and families at often the most challenging of times. And the support provided by, by Marie Curie is only possible through the magnificent fundraising efforts of countless volunteers. And each March, the Great Daffodil Appeal helps to raise awareness and funds that allows Marie Curie to continue to provide the fantastic support and care to people all over Scotland. And I recently joined local volunteers in WIC, collecting for the Great Daffodil Appeal. And 
The generosity from the local community was absolutely fantastic. I'd like to congratulate them on their 955 and 72 pence that they collected. But I must admit, I had a great couple of hours just chatting to them and laughing and getting to know them. And, uh, well, I must say, I, I knew most of them already, being from a small community. But this is only one of the groups active in Caithness, Sutherland and Ross that I'd like to take this opportunity to thank. In the Highlands, around 2,575 people die each year from cancer, with 1,930 requiring palliative care. And in the last year, Marie Curie nursing team in the Highlands have seen 189 people over 1,403 visits. And even with this impressive level of care being provided, it's still estimated that one in four people miss out on palliative care at the end of their lives. And this is why I welcome the actions from the Scottish Government in setting out its strategic framework for action in palliative and end of life care. We know that when asked, the vast majority of people would like to be cared for at home or in their own community. And that specialist and general palliative care services have a proven record in reducing admissions to accident and emergency, can prevent unplanned hospital admissions and support appropriate discharge into the community. And in 2017-18, nearly 88% of those who died were able to spend their last months of life at home or in a community setting. Hospices play a critical role in supporting people to achieve their wishes to spend their last days at home or in the community. And in the NHS Highland area, over 92% of people achieved their preferred place of death. And without the support of the third sector, it would be impossible for health and social care partnerships to meet these needs and the needs of those living with a terminal illness. Evidence suggests that investing in palliative care services can make efficiencies and savings in the wider health and social care system. And the London School of Economics suggests that extending specialist core palliative care services to those would benefit, that would benefit could result in net savings of over four million pound. So as we mark the great daffodil appeal this evening, can we both celebrate the hard work and commitment of Marie Curie staff and volunteers, but also recognize the significant funding requ required to carry out this work and absolutely endorse what Brian Whittle said about the need for us all to come together. And I think that this is the perfect setting for us to do so. Thank you. Lewis MacDonald, followed by David Torrance. Thank you very much. And I too congratulate Gordon MacDonald in his absence uh, on securing this debate and Emma Harper on opening it. As I think every speaker so far has said, Marie Curie has played a vital role in providing palliative care across Scotland and beyond for many years. And the Great Daffodil Appeal has become a widely recognised symbol of the support which the charity provides for people with cancer and with other terminal conditions. The pins which many of us are wearing today are not just a way for Marie Curie to raise much needed funds for its hospices, home care nurses and support networks. They're also a way in the sense that Brian Whittle uh, so uh, well illustrated. They are a way for many people to remember those they have lost to cancer and other illnesses and who benefited in their final days from the expert care of Marie Curie nurses. There's no uh, Marie Curie hospice in Aberdeen, but there are something around 50 Marie Curie nurses working in Aberdeen and across the Grampian area to support people with cancer and terminal conditions, making over 6,000 home visits to over 1,000 people uh, in 2017-18. The helper service run by Marie Curie, which sees volunteers go into the homes of those who are receiving end-of-life care to provide support and friendship, has also recently been reorganised in our area to cover the whole of the north of Scotland uh, and provides a very valuable service with nearly 100 volunteers in Grampian alone. And a service particularly valuable, I think, to people in rural areas who are undergoing end-of-life care, uh, support to their families, and, and generally to people who find it difficult otherwise to access the kind of support they need. Marie Curie, of course, is one of the longest-running charities supporting terminally ill patients, but in Aberdeen in the North East, as in many areas of Scotland, they work alongside other national and local charities, and I know 
certainly the Marie Curie uh, people with whom I deal are very uh, keen to emphasize that they're part of a wider family uh, of support uh, for those with cancer. Uh, Aberdeen has its own Maggie Center providing support and advice to cancer patients, while Macmillan Cancer Support is a regular advice session at Aberdeen Citizens Advice Bureau, as well as running local support groups. And Clan Cancer Support works to support uh, cancer patients and their families across Orkney and also in uh, across Grampian and also in, in Orkney and Shetland. Cancer patients from the Northern Isles, as those members from that area will know, come to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary very often for cancer treatment. <clears throat> and Clan provides accommodation for patients and their families at Clan Haven, as well as counselling and therapy at the purpose-built Clan House in Aberdeen. So the family of support for people in these circumstances is very important. Marie Curie nurses particularly play uh, such a key role in providing practical palliative care to patients with terminal cancer and other diseases. It relies on goodwill to raise the funds required to provide those services. It enjoys huge goodwill, but it's important for all of us, and perhaps especially for government, to recognise that such voluntary uh, efforts, such fantastic voluntary effort, cannot do it all on its own. As our population ages, demand for palliative care, as Emma Harper said, is only going to increase. Much of this demand will fall on integration authorities, health boards and local councils, all of which face their own funding challenges, perhaps especially but not only in my own region of the North East. And so it's vital that the Scottish Government continues to uh, address those issues to look at supporting the effective integration in health and care, as we've debated here on a number of occasions, and provides the support the whole sector needs uh, in going forward. Inevitably, Marie Curie will see an increase in demand for specialist nurses, and they will need to continue uh, to receive that support. So let me close, presiding officer, by paying tribute to all of the nurses and volunteers for Marie Curie who do such vital work in what can be such a difficult area. And to acknowledge also all those, including yourself, who deliver, and all those who support the Great Daffodil Appeal every year, allowing this uh, important work to continue uh, and allowing that role to be played uh, into the future. Thank you very much. David Torrance, followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to thank Gordon MacDonald for securing this debate in the Chamber today and allow allowing us the opportunity to speak about Marie Curie and their annual Great Daffodil Appeal. I'd also like to welcome all the Marie Curie staff and volunteers to the Parliament today. Every year since 1986, the Great Daffodil Appeal calls on people across the country to donate and wear a daffodil during the month of March so that Marie Curie can continue to care for people with terminal illness who deserve the right of high quality, patient friendly and sympathetic care. Marie Curie helps to relieve the physical, emotional and financial stress on terminally ill individuals and their families through the service and support. The invaluable services that provide allow us with palliative care needs to retain an element of independence and control by granting them the option of leaving the hospital and staying in the comfort of their home with a guarantee that they will be cared for by hard-working and compassionate nurses. In Fife, 89.3% of patients supported by Marie Curie last year spent the last six months of their lives at home or in a community set setting allowing 97% of patients to pass in their place of choice. Marie Curie does an excellent job of respecting its patients' wishes and its provision of social care, which is no doubt an integral part of palliative care. In Fife, Marie Curie, in partnership with NHS Fife, has been commissioned to provide a variety of nursing, emotional and practical home-based support, everything from helping patients to manage symptoms, to assistance with meals, or to a weekly chat. In Fife, approximately 4,190 people die each year, and 3,140 of these individuals have a part of care needs, meaning about 75% of those who pass away need assistance. That is why a great daffodil appeal is of such great importance. In Fife alone, a team of 13 Marie Curie nurses conducted 4,062 visits and saw a total of 338 patients last year. Along with a nursing team, 153 dedicated volunteers gave her time to support terminally ill patients and their families across Fife. Marie Curie's Befriending Service, Helper in Fife is currently supporting 27 families with more volunteers due to begin training. Marie Curie's support in the area is invaluable to countless members of my community and has been and continue to be and be touched by their services. Last year in October, I had the pleasure of meeting with representatives and heard more about how we make a real life-changing differences in the lives of those they serve. 
I believe it is vital for people to be made aware of these services that Marie Curie provides and for them to take advantage of these services. If they or someone they know is struggling to care for his or herself, as no one should be or have to endure illness or suffering in isolation. My constituency of Kirkcaldy is probably home to a Marie Curie charity shop. Since its opening, Marie Curie shop has proven time and time again to enhance my constituency. The shop, run by volunteers, raises awareness for causes, encourages charitable giving in my area, and most importantly, highlights the organisation's impact on the area. Volunteers are a backbone of Marie Curie, and I cannot praise them enough, for without them, Marie Curie would not be able to provide the level of care and support that it does. The Kirkcaldy Fundraising Group has raised £24,310 since forming in August 2014, and currently has six active members who are taking part in the Great Daffodil Appeal collections this month. Volunteers deserve our sincerest gratitude and support for all their hard work and dedication. I am fortunate to have the opportunity to join volunteers on many occasions and help with their fundraising efforts. It is an incredible experience to see fellow fifers of all age groups with big smiles on their faces, tins in hands, encouraging and inspiring others to do good in the community. I have seen firsthand how proud and happy the volunteers are to lend a hand and be part of such a worthy cause. Volunteering allows people to give back to a community which is truly satisfying and a humbling experience. That is why I am very much forward, looking forward to offering my help to my local fundraising team once again during this year's appeal and will be joining them during March down in Kirkcaldy High Street. In conclusion, presiding officer, I wish the Marie Curie organisation and all their volunteers who are involved across Scotland all the best in the Great Daffodil Appeal of 2019. I, along with my staff, will be wearing a bright yellow daffness, daffodil to raise awareness and make a difference, and I would encourage everyone else to do the same. Alex Cole Hamilton, followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I, too, start by echoing the Chamber's thanks to Gordon MacDonald for securing time to debate this important issue this afternoon. Um, we cover many topics in this chamber, but I think that the debates we have about end-of-life care are some of the most poignant and, the, and some of the most profound. I'm very privileged to speak in this today. Um, in Edinburgh, and I'm also grateful, I've been reflecting, listening to other people's contributions, that the experience of members across the country are very similar to mine in terms of the, uh, the work that Marie Curie do to give comfort and compassion to people in their, in their last and sometimes very difficult hours of life. Um, all told, there are only 23 Marie Curie nurses in the Lothian region, but their reach extends far beyond that. They give out more than palliative care. They give compassion and they give love, not just to people in their final hours, but those who love them around them. And I think that speaks volumes to the character of the people that choose that life, that choose that profession. Not everybody could be a Marie Curie uh, nurse. In the time that I have available to me, I want to offer two reflections that, uh, on events that happened to me since I spoke in this debate last year. Um, and the first was a, a visit organised by Marie Curie to their Frogston Hospice in Edinburgh, where lots of my constituents will spend their last days. Now, it was a familiar place to me because my wife's gran had died there in 2002, and I reflected that to the receptionist uh, at, the, at the door when I arrived. And she said, well, what was your... Um, what was your grand's name? I said, well, her name was Bridie, but it was 2002. And she said, well, you mean Bridie Douglas? So 15 years, like 16 years later, the receptionist still remembered my wife's grandmother with fondness. And it was that human interest, that, that desire to get to know the people in their care and to see the human being and the life story behind them, um, which really struck with me. The second um, reflection I'd like to offer is uh, something that happened exactly this time last year, that my wife's uh, father... Um, was taken into hospital with what was suspected to be a simple bladder infection. He had profound MS, so he was very prone to this. But, but it became apparent very quickly that this was actually advanced uh, bladder cancer, uh, or liver cancer, rather. Um, and it was clear that he would only have uh, uh, weeks, if not days, to live. The battle then was to get him home, um, and we really struggled with that, as many families do, to make sure there was a, an adequate social care package uh, underpinning that so that we could give him his last days at home where he definitely wanted to be. Marie Curie were vital to that. We could not have done that without the Marie Curie nurses coming in to help. And in those last six days, from the, his discharge from hospital to when he, he sadly passed away, um, we were able to build a, a bubble of love and light and happiness around him in his family home with the support of the Marie Curie nurses. They offered 
so much more than I ever expected of them. I'd never seen them in operation quite as I did at Rob's bedside. They taught me to massage moisturizer into Rob's arms because he was uh, very dehydrated, as most people are when they're coming towards the end. And it was one of the most intimate um, experiences I'd, I'd had with my father-in-law. I talked to him as, as I did it. They taught me how to rehydrate him um, by putting water to his mouth. But there's, their care stretched far beyond uh, Rob's final hours. And it was actually really struck home to me that a week after Rob's funeral, a Marie Curie nurse appeared at the door with a bunch of flowers and a mobile telephone number. And that offer of continuing pastoral support, which we have lent into from time to time. But simply presiding officer, they made what could have been a tragic and very sad experience, one that we reflect on with with fondness and, and love. And I thank everyone for them. I thank everyone who's in the chamber today supporting them. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to debate this in Parliament today. Thank you. Bruce Crawford, followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Firstly, I'd like to sincerely thank my good friend, Gordon MacDonald, for securing this debate in the chamber this evening. Also, Emma Harper for leading the debate so effectively. I welcome those who are here in the gallery. Also, President Officer, to support the work that Marie Curie do. Um, it's been very interesting, I've got to say, hearing the experience of others around the chamber this evening and their own contributions they've been making to Marie Curie and some of the challenges they've faced in their own lives. Uh, incidentally, I, I joined Gordon MacDonald last week in the photo shoot that Gordon had organised, and I welcome, I, I thank him for that too. Uh, I also thank him for being able to wear one of these splendid top hats uh, in yellow, which Marie Curie had. I'm, I've already had some Mickey taken out of me in one constituency in the local folk at photographs that appeared in the Stirling Observer. However, what I really want to do tonight is uh, you know, thank the Marie Curie organisation for the incredible work they do um, providing end-of-life care for people in my constituency. And moreover, also recognise the role of the many uh, volunteers that they have. Now, I think it was almost two years ago I believe I was the, one of the first, if not the first, MSP to host a Marie Curie Blooming Great Tea Party fundraiser. I had held the event in my own office, in the constituency office at STEP in Stirling, Stirling Enterprise Park, I should say, as well attended, mostly by employees from the many offices in the complex surrounding me. But who doesn't love a good cup of tea, a slice of cake and a good blether? Um, but why do I say that? Why do I tell you this story? Because it struck me, President Officer, that in invariably the conversation for those who turned up and attended the Tea Party turned to what Mar Marie Curie meant to them. And I want to come to that a bit later. But first, let me say that Marie Curie shop in Stirling City Centre is incredibly well run by a dedicated um, team of local volunteers. And I had the chance to drop in recently as part of Stirling's bid to become Europe's volunteer capital and speak to Morag, the shop manager, about how important that place actually is to local people. It's a place that people not only pop in for a wee bargain, but also to have a chat with the people who are the volunteers in the shop. And they do a great job, as you might imagine, while having that, that blether of raising funds on behalf of Marie Curie. And most recently, I caught up with local Marie Curie activists, Frida and Jim, in Stirling's Morrison store on Friday. Jim's area manager, and he was telling me about the varied role he has in the organisation. And Frieda is a local volunteer, originally from Bannockburn, and as someone who's worked in hospitals, was able, over a number of years, was able to tell me her story about how important Marie Curie had been as a service to her. The two were handing out these daffodil pins that, that most of us think, are, or all of us are wearing this evening. And it was quite remarkable to see so many people give so generously to the bucket that was there. It was humbling, actually. Um, so, but, President Officer, the, the work that Marie Curie do means so much to um, every one of us in this chamber and many across, our, our, across the country and in our constituencies. Most of us will know someone, I think someone has said this already, who have been through an end of life experience. It's not just the patient that experiences this difficult situation, but also the family and close loved ones too. Um, and having the help and advice from Marie Curie's staff to provide has been a real and invaluable lifeline to so many people. The nurses provide that free nursing to people with terminal illnesses, one-to-one -one nursing care, which can be overnight or even at very short notice in a crisis. Just knowing that service is available brings comfort to people who are going through that difficult time, no matter how bad it can get, that help is there. And I've witnessed firsthand just how much care the Marie Curie nurses provide to people. 
Let me quickly, very quickly, President Officer, tell you that story. One of the Marie Curie office, uh, nurses visited my office to let me know about their work locally. And by sheer coincidence, that nurse had been at the end of life carer for one of my staff's mothers. And that reunion between these two people, who'd been through a lot together, was at the same time deeply emotional as, as it was joyful. You could see in both their faces just how much it had meant that joint experience had meant to them. It was a very moving moment I will never forget. Sign Officer, Marie Curie is a vital crutch to those who are going through perhaps the most difficult event that life invariably throws us. At. Thank goodness that organisation exists. Without it, the people in these situations would have a much more difficult time and the families involved have had a much more difficult time. I'm sorry I can't be at the reception this evening um, to, to join others uh, uh, to celebrating the work of Marie Curie and the Blooming Great Tea Party. Thank you very much. Uh, before I, I call Mr Mountain, there are um, three speakers still to go, plus the Minister, so we're running out of time. I'm therefore minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. I would ask Emma Harper to move a motion without notice. Formally moved. Thank you very much. question is that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Are we all agreed? That is uh, therefore agreed. And can I just remind members who may be concerned that um, parliamentary receptions, etc., are not allowed to begin until business in this chamber is finished. And can I have, please, Edward Mountain, followed by Maureen Watt. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thought I'd just calculated I had 10 minutes to speak, and then you made that comment that I was standing between people and their reception. So I'll be mindful of the time. But I would like to thank Gordon MacDonald for, for bringing this and Emma Harper for speaking in this debate. Now, when I met with the representative, Marie Curie, in December last year, I was inspired by the care and support that they told me they offered to patients across the Highland. And the help that this charity provides, I believe, is vital. Last year, 1,403 visits to terminally ill people at home across the region, supporting 92% of people to die in the, in the place of their choice. Now, let's not forget, and I don't forget, that this wouldn't be possible without the huge energy that goes into the fundraising efforts of all those fundraisers. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay special tribute to the 14 local fundraising groups in the Highlands who've raised over £170,000 in 2017 and 18. That money will go a long way to support loved ones across the Highlands. And I also want to thank Gordon MacDonald for reminding this chamber and this parliament that the motion, for, through his motion, that Scotland still has a way to go, ensuring that everyone with a terminal illness receives the care they need. As we've heard, that one in four people miss out on the palliative care they need at the end of life. And I believe we need to do better. And I'm delighted that the government is stepping forward to try and achieve this by 2021. Come on, be bold, do it beforehand because I believe the clock's ticking for all of us as far as palliative care is concerned, because we're seeing a rise in the population of Scotland, and this increase in age will mean there'll be an increasing demand. Now, I believe that this issue does unite the Chamber, as we've heard this evening, because many of us have lost a family member or friend to a terminal illness. Now, I know from personal experience that without palliative care, our loved ones cannot make the choice uh, where they want to be for their final moments. And that's why it's important. I believe that dying with dignity is the mark of a civilised society. Now, I strongly believe that everyone must have the right to die where they want to, in the location of their choosing and at home. And that's why I think this charity is so important. And that's why I wear the daffodil every year, because people know that we are supporting this wish. Now, I'm going to make a demission that on Saturday I will be taking it off, uh, purely because I'll be going to a rugby match and I'm not sure that I want to be seen wearing a daffodil on Saturday. But every other time of the day and the week, I'm very happy to wear it and support it. I can see that that didn't go down very well, but I just think from a rugby point of view, I'm not going to wear it. So I urge everyone to wear the daffodil and to join the great daffodil ap ap appeal in March this year and to take time to thank all those people from Marico who are helping our friends and family in their last days. Thank you. Uh, we don't have Maureen Watt. We appear to have had a wee problem with her button. 
Uh, can I tell everybody, however, she looks very fetching in that yellow top hat. <laughs> and uh, therefore, the last speaker in the open debate is Liam McCarthy. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, happy to step in as a substitute for, for Maureen Watt. Can I too uh, thank Gordon MacDonald for allowing uh, this debate to take place and Emma uh, Harper um, for not only stepping into the breach but taking on the mantle that you have so ably carried over recent years in leading uh, this debate. I think debates in this place always benefit uh, from the ability of members to draw on personal experience. And I think we've heard uh, that uh, very powerfully this evening, notably from, from Brian Whittle and, and my colleague Alex Cole uh, Hamilton. Um, as ever, I pay tribute to the phenomenal work done by Marie Curie nurses, staff, volunteers on behalf of those uh, with a terminal illness and, of course, their families. Um, I think we should never fall into the trap of being complacent about that, and I'm fairly sure and confident that we won't. I think we also need to bear in mind, and, and the, the motion indeed reminds us of this, that there are still thousands of people across Scotland in need of palliative care who are still missing out. And with an ageing population, uh, annual death rates on the rise, uh, the, uh, the numbers unable to access uh, the end-of-life care they need uh, will inevitably increase unless steps are taken to address this. Now, I, I very much welcome the government's uh, action plan for palliative care and, and, and end-of-life care. It does, as others have reminded us, commit to ensuring that by 2021, everyone who needs palliative care will get it. But for it, that to happen, I think we'll need to see a greater priority from health and social care partnerships as well as resourcing uh, from government. Um, to meet that target, we'll also have to address uh, what is, a, I think, a discrepancy and an inequality in access. And I think Emma Harper was absolutely right uh, to point to the fact that for those over 85, for those living alone, ethnic minorities, those living in deprivation, um, there are disparities, disparities also between those um, suffering from cancer as opposed to those with other terminal conditions uh, like dementia, motor neuron disease, uh, heart failure and others who seem to be overrepresented amongst those who aren't getting access to that care. Deputy President Officer, I'd also like others uh, want to acknowledge the efforts of those responsible for delivering uh, these services in my own constituency in, in Orkney. As I've said before, this is a relatively new uh, service in the islands, but already it has shown its worth and value. Feedback from those who have benefited from the service remains incredibly positive and inevitably, as, as a result, demand is likely uh, to continue to, uh, to, to grow. Uh, and I think more so uh, than I suspect the two nurses that are currently operating in in Orkney will be able uh, to support. So I would hope and expect every effort to be made to enable that demand to be met, working closely with GPs and other relevant services, reflecting, I think, the essential partnership between voluntary and public um, sectors that uh, is, uh, is so essential in this area. It certainly appears to be strong support within the Orkney community, reflected in the response to fundraising um, uh, heroics of uh, Linda Lenny and her uh, team of local volunteers. And I'm delighted that Linda is again here uh, in the chamber to witness uh, the debate and to attend the reception uh, tonight. In conclusion, again, can I congratulate uh, Gordon MacDonald for enabling this uh, debate to take place. Can I wish um, everybody involved in the great Daffodil field every success again this year. And to all the Marie Curie nurses, staff and volunteers, I, I offer my sincere thanks for the exceptional work that they do in allowing people uh, to die with dignity and in a place of their choice. Thank you very much indeed. I call Joe Fitzpatrick to respond to the debate for around seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And um, can I add my congratulations to Gordon MacDonald for securing tonight's debate and also to Emma Harper for um, stepping into the breach and, and leading tonight's debate. I want to also thank members from across the chamber for what I think has been uh, an excellent, excellent debate with some particularly powerful contributions, particularly um, I want to thank Alex Cohamerton and Brian Whittle for the, the, the very touching contributions, um, which I think puts, puts it into context about why, why we all think that, that Marie Curie is, is so important. I have to say, uh, the fact that the Great Daffodil Appeal is still going strong after more than three decades is, is, is just a fantastic achievement um, of which the Marie Curie staff and volunteers should be rightly proud of. 
We all agree, I, I know, because we've heard it across the chamber, the fantastic work that Marie Curie in Scotland do is invaluable. They fulfil a role which is vital in supporting those nearing the ends of their lives and also in sustaining a multitude of families and friends around them. Since I have been appointed to be part of the health team, I've been immensely impressed by the range and breadth of the support that Marie Curie offer. Um, and it was, it was good to hear from across the chamber some examples of that um, from right, right across Scotland. And there's a number of great examples from my own constituency, constituency in Dundee um, where um, you can really see that Marie Curie are a, a much broader organisation and provide much a broader range of support than perhaps people would traditionally um, expect of um, uh, the organisation. Um, the skills, compassion, care that is provided is more important than ever as the demand for such services is set to increase due to the well understood changes in our population, which I think um, Lewis mentioned earlier. We all want a fairer, healthier Scotland and the Marie Curie Great Daffodil Appeal presents a timely opportunity for us to reflect on the challenges we face in meeting these specific needs and an opportunity to set out the concrete steps we are taking to address them. Scotland is already a world leader in the field of palliative and end-of-life care and I am proud of the progress we have made over the past few years. Increasing numbers of specialist staff, improving access to services and through our programme of health and social care and integration, putting services under the control of our local communities. However, there is more to do. The Scottish Government is committed to working with organisations like Marie Curie to take forward our shared aim of ensuring that everyone in Scotland who would benefit from palliative and end-of-life care has access to it by 2021. That is an ambitious goal, but one we feel is within our reach. In December 2015, we published our strategic framework for palliative and end-of-life care. <clears throat> the framework sets out a number of commitments designed to improve the quality and availability of palliative and end-of-life care in Scotland. However, to achieve this vision, it's essential that we create the right conditions nationally to support local communities in their planning and delivery of palliative and end-of-life care services, to help ensure that the particular needs of each individual are met. This ethos is at the heart of the health and social care integration. Integration authorities are working with local communities and building on the expertise of organisations like Marie Curie to commission services that are truly designed to meet the palliative and end-of-life care needs of their local community. By commissioning services in this way, improvements will be driven through meaningful collaborative partnerships with the palliative and end-of-life care community. Key to the success of this work is the ability to, of integration authorities to power to drive real change. They'll manage almost £9 billion of the resources that NHS boards and local authorities previously managed separately. And this year, that includes more than £550 million of health investment to support integration and social care, increased to exceed £700 million in 2019-20. In We've also asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to work with integration authorities to test and implement improvements in the access to and delivery of palliative and end-of-life care. Data is vital. Without it, we don't know whether people are, are indeed getting the palliative and end-of-life care that they need. Without it, local communities can't commission the services needed to support people's care, and care plans will remain hard to share. This data challenge is recognised in our SFA, which contains a commitment to support improvements to the collective analysis, interpretation and dissemination of data and evidence relating to the needs, provision, availability, indicators and outcome in respect of palliative, palliative and end-of-life care. A working group is tasked with, tasked with clarifying the data requirements to ensure that they are valuable for both um, individuals receiving care and the integration authorities in the planning, commissioning and improving of the local services. Work with NHS Information Services Division, ISD, the, the, the data group are investigating a, a number of areas where data collection and use can be improved. I want to now turn to the values and skills people need from our health service and social care staff. It's, it's difficult to discuss death and dying. And to do this, this well requires a great deal of personal resilience and compassion. 
However, developing the skills to have these difficult conversations is critical for having timely and helpful anticipatory care planning conversations. Having these conversations and sharing what matters to the person at the end of their life can make all the difference to how and where they die and, and, are, and the care that they receive. Enabling people to do, to be with those that are most appropriate as they approach death is not a simple skill. It calls not just on people's technical skills, but on our own values, life experience and compassion. This will, sorry, the locally focused uh, community work such as that, the compassionate Inverclyde embodies the ethos of the whole community coming together to support each other with compassion at points of grief and uh, loss and change. Finally, I want to touch on and say a bit about um, palliative care and end of life care research. Over the past few years, the Scottish Government has provided funding to our new well-established palliative care research forum to support Marie Curie and academic colleagues to undertake work to help us to develop a clearer picture of research and data gaps and to support improvement in identifying people who might benefit from palliative care approaches and coordination of their care. This will be helpful in realising our shared vision for palliative care in Scotland. In closing, Presiding Officer, I'm optimistic that through our combined efforts and continued productive collaboration, work towards our shared goals will be able to bring about further innovation and transformative change in palliative, palliative and end-of-life care. And I look forward to continuing our work with Marie Curie on this shared aim for many years to come. I also look forward to joining um, other members in the garden lobby for the Marie Curie reception immediately after this debate, which is a further opportunity for us all to thank Marie Curie and their staff, nurses, volunteers for the amazing work that they do for us all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. Uh, can I add my personal thanks to all the Marie Curie volunteers uh, that are sitting in the gallery tonight? Thank you very much, and this. Oh, and my apologies for being unable to come to your reception. Uh, <laughs> this meeting is closed.